after a while, but Brother Shabir has to make an announcement before that. Assalamu alaikum again. So uh, a brother has approached us here. His name is Habib. You will see him on your way out. Uh, he's trying to help a sister who is suffering from cancer. She's from Tooting here in, in London. She has to get uh, some of her treatment in Germany. So all of this is very expensive. Uh, the brother has provided some documents here, letters from hospitals and, and uh, professionals showing that this has to be done, and some description of the cost. They have set up a GoFundMe page, and uh, the brother has some little slips to hand out, uh, giving you the exact address of the GoFundMe uh, page. It's GoFundMe slash Shazia, that's the name of the sister, spelt with a double A. So pick up a slip like that to remind yourself and uh, do what you can to help the sister for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan. Don't know the Please uh, send in your questions. And in the meantime, I'll, I'll look around and get Dr. Jamal to come to the stage as well. While the questions are coming in, I'd just like to remind you that uh, tomorrow's program in East Ham, the venue has changed. Uh, it was supposed to be at the Bilal Masjid, but uh, later on they uh, cancelled the hall for us, so the brothers had to arrange. It's in uh, Bolin Banqueting Suite, 7 to 11 Barking Road, East Ham, E6. Uh, if you want to copy the address, it's available on the poster here, the banner here, so you could just write it down if you need it. Just pass it on. Uh, the question was passed me very simply because it occurred. I know, brother, that Imam said. No, the meaning is in the middle, you see. <laughs> Looking for it. Okay. Uh, it says, this ayat in, Quran, in the Quran it speaks about the ad, justice, and custom. In the ayat al Muhammad or in the Shabihat. Is this among the more decisive uh, ayat or ones that has differing meaning? 
No, in, in so far as I'm concerned, uh, the principle of justice and the rejection of injustice in any form or shape is definitely, I, I consider it to be a mahkamat, non changeable. But maybe in some applications, of adl in a given situation, there could be perhaps some room. But the principle of adl itself is muhkam. Allah It's just like saying to establish salah uh, and five times because the Quran alludes to the number is muhkam, absolutely. But when you interpret the ayat about wudu or masah, msahu bi rusikum wa arjulakum or arjulikum, they could be variations in details, but not in the principle itself. There's some here for which are clearly intended for you. Brothers and sisters, I don't, um, necessarily think I can answer the question. I will I will say it and give a, a little a brief statement. Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, a house, uh, I have a family who's practice, who practice Islam. They read the Quran. They pray. They fast. My only worry is that my wife didn't allow my daughter to visit their aunts. How can I change it? I can't change it unless I understand the reason why. It may be good reason. You know, المر على الدين خليل فيندور أحدكم يخالف person will follow the religion of a very close companion. Therefore, let every one of you please be, be mindful whom you should choose as a friend. So we'd have to find out what's the reasoning. I'm sure there's some rationale. Just for the record, I want to um, share with you Harvard Law School, where President Obama went. In the entrance of the law library, of the uh, faculty library, is an ayat of the Quran. And they say it is one of the greatest uh, testimonies of, of, of justice. All you who believe stand out firmly as witnesses for Allah, even against your own self. That ayah in the Quran is prominent in the, in the Harvard Law School. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. How can we avoid sins? That, that's the point I was making. We're going to sin. All the children of Adam are sinners. And the, the best sinners are those who repent. So Allah knows we're going to sin, but repent. And, you know, uh, he gave us a lot of uh, activities to do to erase the sin. Whoever fasts in the month of Ramadan with faith, seeking a reward from Allah, Allah will, you know, forgive us our sins. Wash out the sins. But the, the, the key, I think, of course, is taqwa. The more taqwa we have, the more... Uh, somebody mentioned remembrance. I don't know if it was Dr. Jamal or someone. One of the speakers mentioned about remembrance of Allah. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Can Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala That the Messenger of Allah remembered Allah in every circumstance. And it's interesting, the ayat in Quran, I begin it, you finish it. Fatkuruni atkurkum. Remember me, I remember you. If the Prophet is always remembering Allah, you know what that means. Allah is always remembering the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. I think the more we, we love Allah, maybe the better opportunity we have to commit less sin. So um, I have a question here related to my uh, subject matter, but before I uh, try to address it, there is some chatter at the back, which is understandable because some people want to leave. Um, but those who are interested in hearing, can you move forward so that we can feel the cohesiveness of uh, the group here and you will hear us better? Please, please move forward. Please. A little bit of movement is good, as uh, uh, Sister Noha demonstrated. When we got up, we felt good, right? So, so get, up, get up and move forward if you can. You'll feel good, you'll feel refreshed. And they're ready to absorb uh, some more, which I hope will be knowledge, uh, um, especially what comes from Dr. Badawi, our senior, and uh, Imam Siraj. 
Okay, so please, please come forward as much as you can. Okay, so the question is this. How would ring structure be explained when some Sahabas and scholars believe the order of the surahs are man-made, that is by the jihad of the, of the people? And the questioner specifically said this is for Shabir Ali. And that rightly so, because that's what I spoke about. So, Jamal, did you hear my talk about ring structure? Yeah. And, yes. In fact, I, I should have said that I already heard about some of this from Dr. Badawi many, many years ago. It's not that uh, some Muslim scholars were totally clueless about this, but to put it in the way that Raymond Sauron has done is, is entirely uh, new. Uh, but uh, uh, Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti had shown that uh, the, <coughs> there are connections between one, the end of one surah and the beginning of another one. And uh, Dr. Badawi had actually elaborated on this somewhat in uh, his uh, series that were uh, broadcast on television, uh, Islam in Focus, I believe it was called, Islam in Focus. And uh, I, I listened to his cassettes that were recorded from that program again and, and again. So if I say something good, it's uh, largely due to the influence from teachers like Dr. Badawi and uh, every good is from Allah. So yeah, these mistakes are my own not to be credited to any of my teachers. So, and, and now the question is, if, if it was put together by Ijtihad, and it's true that uh, some of the Sahaba thought that it doesn't matter if you mix up the order of the surahs because uh, the, the each surah is an independent uh, a unit, um, then how can we explain this ring structure? So what I would say is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was guiding the process that resulted in the final copy which has now become popular and is known around the world. And, and there is an eye of the Quran that I interpret around, uh, along the, these lines. It's in the 75th chapter where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, <laughs> Uh, when the Quran is being revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, it is noted that the Prophet ﷺ was trying his level best to try and, and repeat it and memorize it immediately. And Allah's assurance to him is, لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجلبي Do not move your tongue therewith in order to hurry the process. It is our responsibility to collect it and promulgate it. When we have promulgated it, then follow its promulgation. Then it is our responsibility to make it plain. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has some responsibility and is assuming uh, responsibility for the whole process. So sometimes people do things, they don't know why they did it. Did you ever like walk up the stairs and then when you get to the top you wonder why did I come up the stairs? Okay. Or you open the fridge and you wonder why did I open the fridge? Okay. So sometimes people do things for reasons that they don't know. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the reasons. Of course he, he won't make us do something and then blame us for doing it. But he could cause us to do something good that we didn't even realize we were doing. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is fulfilling his whole purpose. Or somebody may intend wrong, uh, but while they intend wrong and they're trying to accomplish the wrong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may use their wrong for some good purpose. Allah mm -hmm. didn't make them do wrong, they chose to do wrong, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using that for some overarching purpose. The shaitan causes us to make a mistake in our prayer. We can't remember how many are God's. So then we are advised, make an extra one, so then you're sure you did the, the correct number. If you're disputing is it three or four, make it, four, make it three, and do one more, now you're sure it is four. And then you do such as the at the end. So that means, in the end, you have prayed more, at least in the extra two sajdas, right? So even though shaitan was misleading you for bad purposes, in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used his misleading for a good purpose, you see? So if the Sahaba and them who were trying their best to collect the Quran were doing this for good purposes. They're trying their best to remember and to collect it the way they were taught. And in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ensuring that there is this massive superstructure. I don't know if I spoke clearly enough in the, in the lecture about the whole Quran being an entire ring composed of many rings. So uh, I spoke about Surah Baqarah being a, a collection of smaller rings. But Surah Baqarah teams together with other surahs to form larger rings. So that the whole Quran is a superstructure made of many smaller rings. 
Uh, and, and you can see this in a way very quickly, and I end with this. You know that the first surah begins, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, saying that Allah is Rabbil Alameen. The last surah begins by saying, Qul A'udhu Rabbil Nas. He is the Lord of humankind. So he's Rabbil Alameen, and he's Rabbil Nas. So you can see an echo in the last surah of what was already said in the first surah. The first surah is a du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This last surah is also a du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can go on and on and show how the entire Quran uh, is, is a super ring composed of many smaller rings. So this much is clear. So we can say that so, so one even each though, second. Uh, yes, it is clear the that uh, some uh, Muslim scholars thought that uh, each surah is an independent unit, now we can see that in, in fact, each surah is in a specific place for a very good reason. You do and one of the reasons is this uh, ring structure. And Allah knows this. We're just discovering and describing what we um, do. Let me do this one because it's similar. Okay. 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 Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, do this one now because it's similar to a question that Dr. Shabir got. It's a very interesting question. It says some disobedient people uh, may. Um, <laughs> Use the hadith. One of you may do the deeds of the people of paradise to what is about an arm's length from it, and do his deed of the people of the fire and into it. May the hadith as a pretense for the dis disobedience. I know exactly what you're talking about. This hadith is not talking about the qadr of Allah. But I heard Dr. Jamal Badawi. He was giving a speech. It's about about 70 years ago, Sheikh Jamal. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago, and, and he was talking about this very hadith, the hadith that I mentioned. In Ahadakum Salayyatlamu bi Amul Ahl Jannah Hatta Ma Yakuna Beno Hu Beno Illa Diroan Fayasbiku Alayl Kitab Fayatlamu bi Amul Ahl Nar Fayadukhulah. So a person is doing the deeds of the people of Jannah until they're this close to Jannah, and then what is written overcomes them. And then they begin to do the people of the, of the people, the hellfire, and then they enter the hellfire. This hadith isn't talking about the qadr of Allah. And Dr. Jamal, better, Dr. Jamal can explain it better, maybe in terms of the Arabic. But I'll tell you this, about 25 years ago, Dr. Jamal, I was um, in New York on my way to, uh, coming back from a visit to a prison. So I had to go to a um, subway, then take a bus. So I was on the subway station, and I'm saying to myself, you know what, Siraj, you gotta really understand about the Qadr of Allah. You gotta study the Qadr of Allah. So as soon as I said that the train comes in, I get into the train, I sit down, and a man next to me he says, are you a Muslim? I said, yes. He said, what do Muslims believe about the predestination of Allah? <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? Are you, are you kidding me? So I you know, really started studying about the Qadr, and I think people miss the Qadr. Allah is never going to be unjust. Allah is never going to make you do something, then punish you for what, you, for what, you, what, you, what you've done. That, and, and Dr. John can expand upon it a little bit more, but what's, what's written overcomes you don't mean Allah made you do it. In the end, we have to take responsibility for everything that we did ourselves. We can't blame it on shaitan. We can't blame it on Allah. We can't blame it on, you know, no one but ourselves. Since yes. you asked me, even yes. though I don't have much to add, mashallah, you've, you've covered it. You see, from one perspective, of course, <clears throat> you can refer to the hadith that Imam Salah mentioned earlier, uh, and others maybe, the things will be you know, assessed according to the end of it, which actually mean to me that if a person done all kind of wrong and even repented towards the very right. last days of his life, alhamdulillah, that his eyes in a state of, of Iman, vis-a-vis -vis someone who died in a state of rebellion. That's one perspective. But the other perspective also, we see, if you look at the wording of the hadith, يَعْمَلُ بِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ الجنة, meaning a person who is doing deeds that in the assessment of anyone around them, mm -hmm. these are the right. deeds of people who right. right. praise and fast and give sadaqah and so on. But in the meantime, as uh, Dr. Suhaib reminded us, the first hadith in Bukhari also, not only in Arba'in and uh, deeds are only rewarded in according, accordance with intentions. And then he mentioned in the hadith, of course, people making hijrah, one to marry a woman that he wants to marry, one to Allah and his messenger. But the action appears exactly the same. Hijrah, 
you know, the prophet is calling people to, uh, okay, hijrah. So it, it appeared to people that he's doing that for the sake of Allah. Yet, salah was hypocrisy, zakah was to uh, show off, siyam, uh, Allah knows because amal, amal ahl jannah is to fast. And who knows whether a person even is fasting or not, let alone the question of niyyah. So there are two perspectives on it, but indeed, Allah is just. I have to apologize to you and to my colleagues yes. here, to the brother or sister who sent the earlier question about whether justice is definitive or non-definitive, because I forgot and I apologize that at the end, there was an important question. What, ما هو موقف العدل في الإسلام? What is the place of justice in Islam. Number one, it is a divine command. Referring to the Quran directly or Hadith. The Quran first. Inna Allaha ya'muru bil You know this famous ayah. Wal ihsani wa ita'idu. So it is a command from Allah. Now for someone not to respond the command of Allah to do justice, we cannot say that this is indefinitive or non non Second, even Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu with, with his reputation of absolute justice, uh, even against himself and his family, subhanAllah, still is commanded in the Quran. It says, وَقُلْ آمَنْتُ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَأُمِرْتُ لِأَعْدِلَ بَيْنَكُمْ I have been commanded by Allah to do justice. And the basic rule in usul, again, if the address is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is an address to all Muslims, except if there is evidence that there is a special thing about the Prophet, or a special concession, or a special additional requirement like the Hajjud. He used to do it all night. Even. So short of any specificity, the address is address to us. Thirdly, Again, we're still in the Quran. I may, I may not need even to go to hadith because there's so many, much evidence in the most important source for us as, as Muslim. Hadith confirms that the action of the Prophet, the hadith include his action. His action was the absolute just among people, even who hated him. But continuing with the Quran again. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kunu qawwameena bil qist shuhada'a lillahi wa law ala anfusikum awil walidhaini wal aqlid. All believers be standing up or stand up for uh, for justice, St uh, standing for for uh, justice for the sake of Allah, and don't let uh, sorry even if it be against your meaning own benefit or your close kins. Right. There is no nepotism. And finally, one of the most noble statements about Adl is about even Adl with the enemy. Between you and him, there is hatred, even. And we read, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kunu qawwameena lillah. It's very interesting, you can think about the significance. Now first, kunu qawwameena bil qist, standing up for justice, and then Allah comes. But this one, kunu qawwameena lillah, reminding you strongly. Shuhada'a lillahi, wa la yajrimannakum shana'anu qawmin, ala illa ta'adilu, ta'adilu wa akhrahu littaqwa. Again, all believers, uh, stand up in uh, for the sake of Allah, qawamina lillah, for the sake of Allah, doing justice or meeting justice, even uh, don't let the hatred. hatred of others dissuade you from doing justice. Do justice, this is close and true, righteousness. So the evidence and place of, uh, of Adl in the Quran and the practice of the Prophet is more than enough in my humble analysis to show that it is a definitive one. Like I said, it's not application. It is Adl for all without any uh, but, uh, bias. Uh, where I get to the real question? Or one maybe? Should I do one? Let me, oh, okay. Sure. Okay, so um, there is a question. Um, I have to be quick because we have actually uh, used up our time here. We are going on extended time now. This is your extended cut, okay? Um, so this question is addressed to me. If God supported the composition and compilation of the Quran, how come he didn't do the same thing with the Bible? Uh, how come he didn't protect and preserve the Bible? So I'm glad the question is asked because sometimes your non-Muslim friends will ask you the same question and you need to know the answer. So I treat it from that perspective. Um, well, we can offer the following. 
Uh, one is that in the case of the previous uh, prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already has a plan that he's going to send other prophets. So if the teachings of a previous prophet uh, get lost or distorted over time, Allah's plan for that is that he will send another prophet. So the impetus and the need to preserve the previous writings was not as great as in the case of the Quran. We can add to this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala largely leaves human beings free uh, to follow the guidance or to, to refuse the guidance. And he intervenes, if we use that term, intervening is not the right term because intervening would almost mean that God is like uh, basically leaving things to run and then once in a while he comes in uh, like to correct things. But he doesn't come in. God is continually uh, looking after the, the universe and the way it operates. But what I mean by intervention is not that he leaves it all and then in, eventually he intervenes. What I mean to say that he largely lets people uh, exercise their own volition and do things the way they want, whether for good or for bad. But he does not tolerate some things. So he, he puts limits on the extent to which people can do evil. So people have been changing the previous scriptures and he's allowing them. But he preserves the previous scriptures to such an extent that he wants to make sure that a basic level of guidance is still available to the people according to his good wishes. And then, in the case of the Quran, uh, he knows that this is the last prophet, this is the last book he's going to reveal, and this has to be preserved for people up until the Day of Judgment, so he promises to preserve the Quran. So in the, in the 15th chapter, in the ninth, ninth ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna nahnu nazalna dhikra wa inna lahula hafizun. We certainly have revealed the reminder, which is a reference to the Quran and the Surah, wa inna lahula hafizun, and we are protecting it. So the one who memorizes the Quran, we call him a hafiz. Here it says that we are the hafizun, that, that's hafiz in plural. Allah is the ultimate hafiz. What does the hafiz do? He preserves the Quran in his memory. Our hafiza, she preserves the Quran in her memory. And uh, Allah is the ultimate hafiz. He preserves the Quran through his whole grand master plan. By comparison, when he refers to the previous scriptures, he says that the, uh, the, the priests and rabbis, istuhfizu. Uh, they have been made to, to like, they have been entrusted with the preservation. So Allah is half of the Quran, and He has entrusted the priests and rabbis uh, to preserve uh, the previous scriptures. And to what extent they have preserved it, we all know very well, uh, and their failure to have preserved it well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us uh, to His preserved book. For that, we thank Him, and we have a responsibility to introduce this book to others as well. Yeah, yeah I, I have one. Oh, I'm sorry. You know I that? thought no, that's a, that's a big. This this one. This is a quick read, and and I love this one because it it, it um goes to my heart. I am a new convert and the only Muslim in my family. Uh, I moved to London with a different mindset and ended up converting to Islam. In the Quran, it mentioned staying away from the disbelievers. How do I manage with my family back home? They are lost spiritually. I hope Allah used me to help them. That's 100% correct. Um, this, this Ramadan, I was in Orlando, and I had dinner with a brother um, <coughs> named Arthur. Took Shahada six years ago, and he's studying at, at Azhar. He told me that um, his, his imam sent him to um, Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau is West Africa, North. It's a small country. Don't get it mixed up with Guinea. Guinea, about 12 million people. Guinea, Bissau, 1.8 million people. He said that an entire tribe took Shahada. 7,000 people. Reason they took Shahada? Because the chief took Shahada. This tribe had rejected Islam 700 years. You never know. Allah will use you. Many of my family members, I'm the first one in my family to become Muslim. Many of them now, alhamdulillah, are Muslims. So, you know, you try. Doesn't mean they're going to convert. It doesn't mean they're going to change. You can't guide those whom you love, but Allah guides to the straight path. Whoever he, he, he wills, just make effort, inshallah. Um, I received a question that uh, amazingly 
was the topic that uh, one person uh, I was told who used to be a Muslim asked me about. I already answered him outside of the premises because the regulation here perhaps uh, would have barred that. But I felt I'm obligated to go out knowing his background to give an answer in the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will yes. guide him. Yes. About the, the question basically it says if punishment of apostasy is death, then where is the uh, freedom, mm -hmm. uh, free will, mm -hmm. and justice? Mm -hmm. Now, I have to say the truth as I believe in it, and as I can do my best, I did research that. I presented a paper on this in the uh, European Council of Fatwa and Research, which included many discerning scholar who would cut your presentation into pieces if there is any error mm -hmm. of istidlal mm -hmm. or methodology. Mm -hmm. But my basic argument is this. It's not my, only my argument that other people like Rashid Rida and many others actually who took that position. Number one, to answer that question honestly without being affected just by tradition. You go right to the Quran itself. The question here is this. Is there any ayah in the Quran that says that the punishment of the murtad, the apostate, is killing? Not one. Not one. And this is an, an important point because the matter of life and death is something that needs to be specified. There are many specifications in the Quran about crimes that are far less than apostasy, which is the ultimate. There is none. Everything in the Quran condemning apostasy, it, yes, it is condemnable, but it always speaks about punishment in the hereafter. Look at the ayat in the Quran, my paper gives it, quotes it fully. Secondly, is there anything in the Quran that goes against killing someone simply because he's left the faith? The answer is many. It's not only la ikrah fi dini qad tabayyan al rush min al ghayb. In Surah Al Kahf, it gives the human being the right to believe and the right and the right to commit kufr, reject faith. But yes, of course, it gives the warning in Surah Al Kahf. وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكُمْ Say, O Muhammad, to people, this is the truth from your own. So there is no compromise. Don't say, ah, oh, okay, no, there is no compromise. Whoever with a will want to believe, let him or her believe. And the identical terms, whoever with a will chooses to reject faith, let him reject faith. The Prophet وسلم, it's told in the Quran what to do with people that you explain Islam and who can ex explain it better than the Prophet What happens if they reject? Then, yeah, the, the, the Quran tells them, you convey that this. فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا If they turn back, it didn't say kill them, imprison them, do this or that to them. فَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَفِيظًا We have not sent you, O Muhammad, on them as a guardian. So there is plenty of evidence of the freedom of it. And Quran make common sense for people really who are affected and influenced by the Quran. If somebody, you tell somebody, okay, if you apostate, you'll pay by your, your neck. What a person who fears for his life do? Right. He becomes a monafiq, mm -hmm. a hypocrite, because mm -hmm. he's afraid. Mm -hmm. And according to the Quran, if you read in Surah Al-Baqarah and others, the hypocrites are much more dangerous for the ummah than the openly kafir. So he's identified as a kafir. A hypocrite could go, pretend to be a Muslim, right. make destruction, implosion mm -hmm. uh, from within. So what sense does it make to say, yeah, I believe, and I don't believe just to keep people 